Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, thanks everyone for coming. Um, it's always exciting to see people coming for a technical presentation. Um, my favorite, at least. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Alon. I'm the vice chair of the Seattle section, and Xiao Dong here is our chair. Uh, unfortunately, the rest of the, um, I mean, the treasurer and the secretary are not here, but there are a few more officers here. Uh, it is my pleasure, actually, to introduce you to uh, Bryce Hesterman. Uh, I have a little bit of about his biography. Bear with me. Uh, Bryce Hesterman is a principal engineer at Aerojet Rocketdyne, where he designs power electronics for space applications. He has 28 years of experience in power electronics and analog design for aerospace, commercial, and industrial application. He was awarded 23 patents and authored and co-authored eight technical papers. He was vice chair of the Denver section of the IEEE Power Electronics Society from <clears throat> 2006 to 2008. He was recently appointed as the interim chair of the Seattle section uh, of the IEEE Power Electronics Society. Uh, adding to that, uh, he's an he's a alumni of, of BYU uh, from Utah, and I um, would not want to thank you for coming and doing this presentation, and the podium is yours. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> so uh, just one, one technical, everybody uh, signed the sheet. The... If anybody didn't sign the sheet, we'll uh, please do that. The, <clears throat> the attendance sheet. So, um, sounds like it is coming over the speakers. Great. <clears throat> um, I got started in power electronics working um, a little startup company um, with a professor and we were designing electronic ballasts. And together we learned about magnetic coupling and, and um, neither one of us were, had a lot of training in power electronics. Um, but we studied that and um, and then I, over, um, over the years, I've attended a lot of seminars and studied and, um, but I always, uh, how would I put it? I had a hard time dealing with magnetic coupling. And it wasn't until 1995 that I met a, a Dr. James Spreen, uh, who came to work for Magnetech. Um, in Indiana, where I was working at the time. He uh, was a PhD from MIT, and he really understood magnetics. And so he was kind enough to uh, spend uh, a fair amount of time teaching me things. And basically, this, these slides are kind of a distillation of what I learned. And it's more than we can possibly cover tonight but um, the slides are online, um, and uh, so you could go back and, and study them in, in more detail. Um, if you didn't get one of the emails from me that had a link to this, if you send me an email to Bryce, B-R-Y-C-E, at IEEE .org, um, I'll I'll send it to you. <clears throat> so the... Um, Here's the, the, the basics of, of what I'd like to cover. Um, looking at uh, um, modeling with electric circuit equations, how you do measurements, and how you create um, equivalent circuits, um, a little bit about magnetic modeling, 
and uh, then some tips that I found from, from taking measurements and how I was able to make the models better correspond um, to uh, the um, actual performance data. Um, and then I wanted to talk a bit about stability, magnetic stability. And this is something that isn't taught very often anymore. Um, and the, the basic idea is that if you have a set of coupling coefficients, it's not good enough that they're between minus one and one if you have more than two windings. Um, there's, a, there's more mathematical restrictions on that. And ultimately what it boils down to is if you pick the wrong set of coupling coefficients and put that into a circuit simulator, your transformer will become an infinite power source and the circuit simulation will not converge or will we'll head rapidly head to infinity. And I will try to explain why that is and how you make sure that you don't pick the wrong coupling coefficients. Okay, so um, my goal is to try to make magnetic coupling a little uh, less mysterious, showing how to model it, measure it, and, and uh, use it in circuit analysis. So in, in the most basic sense, um, you have two windings that are coupled, and only part of the flux that's in one winding ends up in the other winding. And, and that goes either way. Um, if you drive the primary or the secondary, still only part of the flux makes it to the other side. So you have some different modeling options. Um, you can use a linear model. Um, you can get parameters that are determined from circuit measurements. And you can, um, you can measure the necessary parameters with fairly high accuracy if, if you know how to do it. And th those are some of the tips that I want to want to give tonight. However, if you're doing a linear model, it doesn't tell you anything about flux. Um, and if all you're trying to do is see how a circuit is going to perform and, and, and you know you're a long way from saturation, then that's a, a plenty good model. Now, there's another way you can model, and that's with, the, um, with re uh, reluctance modeling. And then you have to have electrical to magnetic interfaces for each winding. And that kind of model explicitly shows the flux paths. And you can do that with linear and nonlinear uh, reluctance paths. And um, you can calculate electrical circuit parameters from magnetic circuit parameters, but you can't start with magnetic, excuse me, you can't start with electrical and then tell what the magnetic ones are. It's kind of a, a one-way street there. So just, I'm gonna go over some very basic equations and, and go through this fairly quickly. Uh, we all know V equals L di dt for an isolated inductor. For two windings, you have to include a mutual inductance. And the, uh, the mutual inductance is in common for both. So in this case, L12 is equal to L21. And that's a, a fundamental circuit theory issue um, that, um, the, that there's only one mutual inductance and uh, and when you go and create an inductance matrix, it has to be symmetric. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. <clears throat> Here's how you put the whole thing together in one big inductance equation. Um, and you just string all the circuit, all the equations together and put the coefficients in the right place. And, and that will describe it um, in the time domain. You can do the same thing in the frequency domain, um, and you end up with uh, the same uh, inductance matrix. And the diagonals are the, uh, these are the, the self-inductances of each winding, and then all of these are the mutuals, and the mutuals are, are uh, um, symmetric. 
so um, the reason why um, the uh, inductance matrix has to be symmetric is uh, due to what's called the reciprocity theorem and it's required for conservation of energy and it's it's messy stuff but I did give some references if anybody wants to look into it and and see see why it is um, and there's a couple of different uh, arguments uh, one is from Maxwell's equations and another one is from uh, stored energy um, but basically if you don't have a symmetric matrix then your energy goes to infinity uh, or you know you have you have a uh, a system that puts out power it's not passive so for two windings we can define a coupling coefficient and probably everybody here is familiar with that you take the 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 square root of the mutual inductance divided by the two self inductances now depending upon how you set up your polarity then you can either have that coupling be from you know minus one to one um, for n windings you can create a matrix where you compute the coupling coefficients for each of the pairs and of course down the middle it's it's unity in that in that matrix and if you do the measurements accurately the coupling here is going to equal the coupling here this matrix will be symmetric in practice measurements aren't perfect and they get corrupted by resistance and capacitance but what I found is when, when I I'll, I'll say I want to measure a transformer I'll measure all the couplings both ways run it into MathCAD a little routine and it says which you know k21 k12 whichever one is the highest one that's the one i use uh, and that seems to have given me the best results when i actually go and try to match a simulation against a physical model um, now here's some other ways that you can can um, you can actually measure this because mutual inductance here this this number that's not something you can measure directly we have to, to um, use some um, technique so one way you can do it is you can take two windings and you can put them in parallel or excuse me in series and uh, this is called series aiding and you measure the inductance and then you can flip the polarity around and measure the inductance again and that's called the series opposing and if you use this formula for the aiding and opposing and divide it out like that then that will give you the coupling coefficient and I've derived that in the slides but but we're not going to go through that um, but I just want you to know that it, it's there and you can and you can uh, look it up and everything just goes back to these simple equations and this is really one of the important things that that Jim Spring taught me was that if I would just write down the equations and work my way through it all this stuff falls out it just takes a, a little a little bit of time to, to work through it and I just I didn't realize the power that I had to compute this stuff starting with very simple things um, now here's an, another way to measure coupling and this one is uh, what's called the voltage ratio method and the idea is you take one winding and you drive it with a voltage source you measure that voltage then you measure the voltage on the other winding and you turn around and drive the other winding measure the voltage on the first one and then if you plug that into this equation it gives you the coupling coefficient and this particular method is really useful for power line type transformers where you can run it you know at 120 volts or 480 or whatever you can drive those windings at the rated voltage um, and then and get this measurement um, now one of the uh, one of the tricky things about a, um, a coupling measurement is that the magnetizing inductance is somewhat variable and so the coupling coefficient itself is variable this 
and, and if, the, if your magnetizing inductance is voltage dependent, this is a nice equation to use because you can drive it at, under the actual operating conditions. And then, then I go through and again, just using those simple basic equations, uh, derive uh, that uh, calculation method. Now, probably the, the, uh, the method that most people use for doing coupling coefficient is this one. Uh, it's what I was introduced to first. And what, uh, what I do is, or what, what you do here, is you take one winding and you short it and you measure the inductance uh, of the open winding and then you put it into this formula where you've got the leakage inductance which is the inductance you measure when the other winding is shorted compared to the self-inductance of that winding. And if you do careful measurements, these two numbers are going to be really, really close. Um, the problem tends to be if you have leakage inductances that are down in the nanohenries and you don't have a good instrument to measure them. In that case, typically what I would do is I'd short the one that has such a low number I can't measure it measure the other one, um, which is easier to measure, and then just go with that. Uh, and, uh, but there are, there are some really nice instruments out now that, uh, that can measure down in the tens of, of nanohenries quite nicely if you need to do that. Um, so again, I, I go through and, and uh, using the same techniques, uh, derive that. So, <clears throat> if you want to de develop a nice transformer model uh, and get all the couplings appropriate, you need to have them with kind of the same base for the magnetizing inductance. So the way I like to do that is if I have an ungapped core, then I'm going to take my um, the oscillator voltage on the, uh, say, network analyzer, and I'll scale it. Uh, so that the volts per turn is the same on all of the measurements. And, and that gives you the highest accuracy if, if you have a meter that allows you to do that. And I take them all at the same frequency, and you want to do the measurement at a frequency where the Q is high. And it does, you don't necessarily want to do your measurement at your operating frequency. You want to do it at a, measure, at a frequency where the capacitive and resistive effects um, are minimal and that a lot of times 10 kilohertz is a great frequency to run at for power electronics sometimes 100 kilohertz uh, very rarely have I done measurements at, at a megahertz but sometimes that makes sense for uh, uh, when the um, inductance values are, are really low uh, and that's you have to get the frequency up high enough to get within the range of the meter because those your typical meter has a 50 ohm basis everything's compared to that and if you're down in milli ohms then it's, just, it's in the noise um let's see here okay so i already measured mentioned that um yeah so you really want to what I, I like to do, if I have a network analyzer to do these measurements, I'll, I'll do a frequency sweep, and I'll look and see, do I have any peaking? And I'll, I'll do my measurements well away from any, any resonant peaks. Okay. So, um, typically we can measure inductances to at least two significant figures. And... Um, the coupling coefficient is actually accurate to more decimal places or significant figures than your measurement because there's a square root involved. So I typically want to use at least four digits. And if it's really close to um, 1, 0.999, then I'm going to want to go 0.999 until I get something that isn't a 9 and then get you know two or three digits of that. Um, and then you'll have something that, that makes sense because when you put it back in your circuit simulator, these days there's enough resolution um, that, uh, that can handle this stuff. And in particular, if you have really tight coupling coefficients, 
and you're using LT Spice, I would use the alternate solver because it's got double precision compared to the regular solver. And then it just, just uh, works its way right through it. Um, now, <clears throat> the, there's a, a polarity convention on coupling. And you can define it any way you want just by saying how I want the voltage measurement to be. In other words, the same transformer can be described with a positive coupling coefficient or a negative coupling coefficient. It's all the same thing depending upon how you uh, define what is your plus and minus polarities. And so you can do it for whatever's convenient for you. Now, here's where it really gets wild. If you've got a three-phase transformer, in order to, to describe it with dots, it takes three types of dots. You can't just use one dot. You've got to have three types. And this, this shows you how to do it. And the other thing is the triple product of the coupling coefficients has to be negative. That means you can have two positives and one negative, or you can have three negatives. And just for consistency, I typically will use a negative coupling coefficient for all three. Um, and <clears throat> okay, so now let's start looking at the equivalent circuits. You can take two windings and put a coupling coefficient between them. And, you know, that's easy to do in SPICE. It's set up for that and, and other circuit simulators as well. Um, and uh, if you want to do some analysis, I found that for two windings, the cantilever model is, is very handy. Um, because, like, if you short this winding here, then this inductor goes away because this is an ideal transformer, and that's the directly measurable parameter. Um, then if you open circuit it and you measure the total inductance here, then you just subtract this from the total and you get that. So it's really easy to do and it's easy to write equations around. Um, and this is, this is what I used when I was analyzing the electronic ballast was, was this model. Um, and I'll, this is the derivation of it, but we won't go through that. Um, now, here's another model that's commonly used, the two leakage inductance model. Um, and in this case, you've got an, a leakage inductance here and a leakage inductance here. And what you've got is an overspecified situation. There's only three parameters that you need to describe this, but you've got more than that. So that gives you freedom that you can, you can split the leakage between these two any old way you want, but that will put constraints on this ratio and on, on this inductance. Um, and, uh, and so a lot of times people say, well, physically, what is this? Physically, what is it? It isn't anything. It's a figment of your imagination. Um, and so there may be some reasons why you say, oh, well, this is the true magnetizing inductance and this is the energy stored here. And then, but, but it isn't because it's always comes, leakage inductance always comes as a pair. You can't really split it up between one side and the other except arbitrarily. Um, and once you realize that, then you realize what freedom you have and you can play, play with things. But, but I like to do it this way and that's my choice because then I don't have to decide. Yeah. yeah so Bryce, uh, the reason that is, uh, is because you have the freedom of choosing the turns ratio, which maybe you were gonna get to that, but you, that was implicit in your slide, you didn't. Right, right, right. That, yeah, that's what I, was, what I was trying to say here is you can, you adjust this and these formulas here, if you work through it, it'll show you what it has to be uh, to make everything work out. You can't make it anything. If you're going to make it match the, the actual coupling, then there, there are constraints. And if you work through it, 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 can, it can be done. I'm just saying that, um, that you have this extra freedom to, to play around with it if there's some reason why that seems to be helpful. And go ahead. The, the reason that it's helpful for a lot of people is you can choose the 
uh, mathematical turns ratio to match the physical turns ratio. And, yeah. And then the leakage inductances have to go where they, you know, you, you need to apportion them properly. At much right, that. right. And so that, that's, that's a convenient thing to do, but it doesn't have any physical basis on how stuff works. Um, and, turns, but, but I mean, yeah, it has the turns, right. But, 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 but <clears throat> um, things really get interesting when you start dealing with high leakage stuff. And then you start saying, well, I don't really care that I need to put in the physical turns. And especially when you start getting into multiple windings, then you can't. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 well, there's a, there's a way you can do things with three windings and beyond that it doesn't work. But you can go beyond three windings if you use the end port model. But that one assigns a, a pseudo leakage inductance to every winding but one. Um, and uh, I, I'll give you a reference on that. And it's actually my favorite model um, when I want to put in a complicated model into a circuit simulator. So the main thing is there's many um, many equivalent circuits, but there's only this many parameters, n times n plus 1 divided by 2. So, for example, uh, a 7-winding transformer, 7 times 6 is 42 divided by 1, 21 parameters that you have to, to measure to, to fully uh, model it. This is a really n nice paper, and I've got a hyperlink to it if you, if you get the PDF. Uh, but it's downloadable from uh, um, the uh, uh, university website there. And these other two models are really quite interesting as well, um, but you have to have an IEEE account or pay for it or, or whatever, but this one's free. So now let's talk about modeling um, with magnetic circuits. Electric circuits are really nice because uh, Kirchhoff's current and voltage laws hold. When you go to do magnetic circuits, you model them with things where Kirchhoff's uh, equations hold also, but in a, in, a, in a magnetic sense. But in the physical world, you can't constrain the fluxes to flow in nice, clean paths the way you can electrons. So everything ends up being much more approximate. Um, but you can still get uh, some fairly good results. Um, this is uh, like two E cores with a big center gap, and I'm going to put a winding around this leg and a winding around that leg, and I can I can measure up, you know, I can compute all of these little reluctance paths here, and I can compute a path through the air here, and and here, and and model it like that, the difficulty becomes in saying, well, what is the reluctance this way? And in, in reality, it's, it's, it's all mushed out into space. But there, there are people who have come up with some fairly good approximations. Sometimes the math is a little hairy. Um, but, uh, um, and, and, and so a, a, an approach that a lot of people take now is using finite element modeling. Um, and uh, I didn't, um, I wasn't really using finite element modeling when I, I wrote this. I actually wrote this nine years ago. Um, and since that time, I've, I've had access to uh, uh, finite element modeling and got a much better picture of what's, what's going on. However, um, I don't have permission from my employer to add that kind of stuff into this talk. So we stick with what's already out there. But I can at least tell you that there's a lot you can learn from finite element modeling. Anyway, um, this kind of sh shows the, the technique that you would go through um, to see what the, the, the self-inductance is um, of a particular winding using this reluctance model. You replace all of the other windings with with uh, with shorts, and then you do series parallel combinations, and you can then you have to translate it back um, 
through the turns ratio squared, but you can figure out the inductance of, of every winding. And the leakage inductances um, is, uh, <clears throat> you replace the, the MMF source for each winding not being considered with a short circuit, and then replace the MMF source for the shorted winding with an open circuit. And the idea is, if you've got a short, you can't force any flux through it uh, if you have an I ideal short. Uh, and so that's why it opens up in, uh, the, uh, in the modeling here. And so there's, there's a fair amount of, of references on this going all the way back to the MIT book from 1943, the classic book on magnetics. And... Uh, um, I've got all, all of these, these references. You can get this on eBay, uh, typically, uh, or one of the, the sites like that if you're interested, or, or many libraries have it. Uh, but all of these are, are really good, uh, good references. Now, getting to energy storage. Um, the magnetic energy stored in one inductor, one half Li squared. Whoops. There we go. Um, so the, the, the question then becomes, well, what if I have a whole bunch of windings? And it turns out that you can put it in matrix form and you can calculate it, what the total stored energy is from all of the, all of the currents, um, um, if you know the, the, uh, the coupling for them. And... This was actually quite helpful to me in working with integrated magnetic structures and, and seeing where the, you know, what the total energy storage was. Now, once you have more than two windings, and you put them together, um, there are additional constraints. And for three coupled inductors, the inductors are passive if you meet that equation. And, and it's not all that intuitive as to where that equation comes from, but in this paper, they derive it. Now, if you've got more than that, you can set up a coupling coefficient matrix like this and put into MathCAD or MATLAB and you go and you use a, a built-in function and calculate the eigenvalues. You don't even have to know what an eigenvalue is. You probably learned about it many years ago in school and never thought about it since. Some people do. Some people think about that stuff, but a lot of us don't think about that much. But anyway, MathCAD knows how to calculate it. MATLAB knows how to calculate it. And, and basically... All of the eigenvalues have to be positive or zero. Um, and <clears throat> so um, what I wanted to do is, is show you a little, um, well, before I get to that, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this this stability stuff, but some consistency tests that you want to do when you're doing a, when you're modeling a transformer. The eigenvalue test lets you know if there are measurement errors, but it doesn't tell you where your mistake was. At least I'm not smart enough to know how to back it out from that. I only know that there is a mistake, and and uh, and typically I would tell you know I'd see this and say oh something's wrong there. Um, and either I'd go back and do it or tell a technician to go back and look at it. But there are some things you can look at. If you've got magnetizing inductances on the same core leg, then they're approximately, the ratios of those should be approximately equal to the square of the turns ratios. And um, the, the leakage inductances, um, you can do things like uh, shorting one winding and applying a signal to the other winding in, in SPICE. And you can compute the inductance that way. Um, you can set up other various test simulations. And if you play around with it enough, you can figure out 
probably what you did wrong. And if you can't, go try and measure it again. And uh, I wish there were a, a, a simpler way to just troubleshoot it. But, but these simple things will at least let you know that you've done something wrong. Now, here's an, an interesting thing that you don't hear about a lot. Inverse inductance matrix. And the symbol often used is gamma. It's like an L upside down. So um, each diagonal element is equal to the reciprocal of the inductance of that winding when all of the other windings are shorted. Um, so there's a way you can, you can actually use this to find something useful. Let's say you have a four winding transformer. What's the inductance at winding one when windings three or four are shorted? Well, what you do is you take your inductance matrix and you split out the parts that you don't need. And then you compute the inverse inductance matrix. And one over that value is the inductance at winding one when windings three and four are shorted. And um, I found this to be useful um, when working with suppliers and you want to specify leakage inductances, but you got this moldy winding thing and they're not going to go and measure every stinking linkage inductance in there. It's just too much trouble. And so what you do is maybe you have them do groups of windings that are shorted together. And using this formula, you can come up with an idea as to where that, what the bounds for that should be. And I, I found this actually works out quite nicely. If you, if you do all the winding measurements carefully, you go in and do this, it does predict what happens when, uh, when you short sets of windings. Now, if you want to take a coupling, you know, a coupled inductor model and stick it into um, a set of equations that you want to, to you know, write uh, equations to describe the circuit behavior. In other words, you're not going to use a simulator. Probably the best way to do that is modified node analysis. This is what SPICE uses, and this is a great book to describe exactly how you do that. Now, here's, here's uh, a, a simple example of how to take um, a, a circuit that's got coupling and and basically write equations um, that, de that describe the circuit. You, um, you come up with all of the voltages and, and write uh, your KCL equations. And, um, and it's just kind of a cookbook thing. You, you, you walk your way through it and, and you'll end up with, um, when you're all done, uh, you can put the whole thing in, into uh, into a, a matrix equation. And I used this when I was working on electronic ballasts um, where I had a big inductor and they had a smaller windings that were used to, to, to heat the filaments on the lamps. And I could handle everything with this, with this uh, matrix equation, put it into MathCAD and, and uh, um, and you can uh, you can you can solve this equation numerically um, in uh, in MathCAD or MATLAB. Obviously, these equations can get m messy with more than two windings. Now, here's something I'm just going to throw out. Dr. Middlebrook came up with a technique he called design-oriented analysis. And there have been two books written on it besides the work that he did. This one just came out last month by uh, Chris uh, Basso uh, from uh, On Semiconductor. And it came in the mail yesterday. It's a nice book. And I bought this one when it first came out back in, I don't know, 2005 or something like that. Um, and this is um, also a, a really good book. What I'm proposing is that there might be a way to deal with multiple windings and all the coupling coefficients using 
Middlebrook's ideas for how to simplify stuff. It was extra element theorem. I've never tried it, and neither have they, as near as I can tell. No one's tried it. Uh, and someday I want to try it. And I thought, you know, maybe that would, something would come of it. I don't know. I'm just kind of throwing that out as a, a challenge if, if somebody wants to do something interesting that hasn't been done. So um, now I want to talk a little, more, uh, a little more about the coupling stability. And I'm going to use uh, MathCAD and write differential equations and show what actually happens here. So here we've got a simple situation. I've got three coupled windings. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume an initial condition on the currents and then just let it go and see what happens. Uh, it's something that you can easily do in SPICE. You can set up an initial condition and simulate it. But I wanted to, to see if I could run it through uh, with, with differential equations and, and see what happens. So here's the way it works. You start out with some magnetizing inductances and a set of coupling coefficients. Then I construct a coupling coefficient matrix and I compute the eigenvalues and they're all positive, so great. I know that this is uh, going to be a proper system. So then I construct an inductance matrix and uh, then I evaluate it and, and I put in the resistor, these my three resistors, I just made it simple, they're all one ohm. And I put one amp into one winding and zero amps into the other two. And I define a current vector, initial condition vector, and then I basically, this is uh, my, my differential equation. Um, I can then compute an inverse inductance matrix, compute the eigenvalues, and I'm not gonna go through all this, but basically you go through these steps one at a time, and when you're all done, you have three sets of equations with um, exponentials in them. And what you have to have is all of the lambdas have got to be negative if the thing's going to decay. If anything's positive, then, then uh, it's, it's not going to work. So um, I checked if the current values at a few points, then I plotted it. And you can see here the currents in, in the two windings start out at zero. This one starts out at one. It decays. The others build up, and then they just kind of head out for a really long time constant, but they eventually decay to zero, which is just what we would expect. Now, um, then I can take this current vector and I can define a function to, 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 uh, to compute the stored energy. And we have an initial value stored energy, and you can see over time the stored energy in that set of coupled windings heads towards zero. Now I'm going to make one slight change. I'm going to change this, it was 0.98, and I'm going to make it 0.99. I got this example here out of a book on spice modeling. Okay? And I checked with the author later on, and I said, you know, these values that you have in your book, if you put them in a spice, they won't run. And uh, he said, well, I never tried. I just pulled it out of a hat. And uh, so anyway, I go through and compute the eigenvalues and look at that. We got a minus, minus value there. And so now let's see, see what happens. Go through the same process, convert you know, the inductance matrix, write all the differential equations, and come up with these coefficients here. And I've got all my lambdas, oh my. Some of them are positive. So let's see what that does. Um, I, uh, I start out with my initial condition. And these are zero, and I let it go. And whoop, heads towards infinity. And um, then this is, you take the total energy of all, the, all of it, and you can see exactly what it's doing. The energy storage starts out positive, quickly goes through zero and the energy storage becomes negative. 
which means it's putting out power. Um, and, uh, and, and so, I, I mean, this can't happen in reality. But if you put it in spice, if it's not LT spice, this will go bad. LT spice checks for, for the eigenvalues. And, and if, they're, um, if it's got a negative one in there, it'll give you a flag. Um, and uh, that, uh, um, I'll brag. I told Mike Engelhardt about it, and he put it in. <laughs> so, and Saber already had it, and uh, and PSIM's going to get it, because I talked with the founder of PSIM at at APAC and explained this to him. Um, so this won't be quite as much of a problem in in the future if we can get, you know, like if we get P Spice to do it. P Spice doesn't listen. I've talked to the folks at, <laughs> at P Spice and. Uh, it's hard to get them to, to do anything, but, but I haven't given up. So um, anyway, I've kind of gone, I've gone through all the slides. Um, does anybody have, have any questions? No questions. Yeah. So why does then all of them have to be, when you said that the K values have to be all uh, you multiply all the k values together, it has to be a negative value. Oh, that's only if you have a three-phase transformer and you're doing the couplings between three windings on different legs. Okay. And so the, the question would be, why, why, is it, why does it have to be that way? And let's see if I can go back, if we can find that. Um, Basically, if, if you look at this and you say, all right, I'm going to define the coupling between this one and this one as, as positive, if you look at the, um, the flux, the way, the way they go around these paths, one of them is going to have to be negative. You just, can't, you just can't make it work out if you trace the flux paths around. Uh, that's really, and you could add more windings on here, but the three or more legs, but three is a is a common situation so we run into. Four. So should we negative? Or it can't be negative. Or so with four, um, you'd have to it get it get it gets more complicated. So like with any set of three out of the four, I know the the triple product has to be negative, but I'd have to sit down and think about it to say okay. what it what it would have to be. It's not. I don't have that off the top of my head. Maybe nine years ago I could have told you, but I haven't thought about that one in a long time. Um, to, uh, um, anyway, so uh, thanks for coming. And, and I just wanted to say I'm, I'm, I'd really like to get the power electronics chapter going again. And if anybody has suggestions for topics or speakers, um, then uh, just just let me know, and we'll we'll see what we can do. I'm also interested if if people like the six to seven time frame. When I was in Colorado, we did seven to eight. Um, I'm just out of show of hands here. Who who prefers early? Okay. Who prefers seven? Okay. Six thirty, huh? <laughs> Okay, and your name is? Okay, thanks, Roger. <laughs> so, yeah, well, that, and um, and I've been thinking about you know people are located in different parts of the of the area. We may want to move the meeting locations around. I know when I was in Colorado, we had three three locations that we rotated between, and we got a different crowd in in each one. Um, so um, anyway, thanks, and I will be in touch with people by email. If you'll be in touch with me, then we'll see what we can, can get rolling. We can maybe have a free form.